It's so good to see you all on another Summer Sunday. We're continuing our series, our wisdom series, and continuing through the book of Job. We're excited. This morning, we have Mr. Jared Siebert, who's going to be bringing the word. He's no stranger to Lakeview. He's a longtime Lakeviewer, and we've got some really cool, fancy titles to introduce him with. He's now an affiliate faculty at Lutheran Theological Seminary, um, as recent as Friday. So congratulations to you, Jared. Yeah. He's also the director of the New Leaf Network, which is a Canadian missional network. And Jared also does tech support at Lakeview. So if you see him around, that's what he's doing. He's not loitering. Let me pray for you before you get started here. Father, thank you for our brother. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the privilege of opening it. I pray that Jesus would see you, would hear your good news, and anoint Jared afresh to, to speak with clarity we're listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it is uh, cricket season back here. Um, and if you've ever, uh, if you were here that one fateful Sunday when I had a very gory interaction with crickets, let's just hope they don't, they stay away from this carpeted area anyway. Um, so if you have not been here in the last couple of weeks, we are walking our way through the book of Job. And if you aren't familiar with the book of Job, it's one of the more bleak and stark books of the Bible. And it belongs in the wisdom section of the Bible library. And it provides a, an interesting counterpoint to some of the other wisdom books. In wisdom books like Proverbs and the Psalms, we learn to see the world in almost a mathematical kind of way. Uh, and here is how that math actually kind of works out. And it goes something like this. Good people do good things, and those good things lead to blessings. And bad people do bad things, and those bad things lead to their destruction. And the cool thing about these, uh, this kind of formula is this is a very solid community recipe. You follow the recipe of our community, you read the side of the box, and even if you know next to nothing about baking, at the end of this process, you're going to have a delicious cake. And the Proverbs and Psalms are really useful for fundamental information. You do well to follow them. But like any good recipe, there are always exceptions. There are always ways in which things can catch you off guard. So what happens if you go to your cupboard and there's no more boxes of Betty Crocker cake mix? What do you do then? Well, with a little more, you know, uh, experience, a little more knowledge, a little more experimentation as a baker, you're going to find that you have all you need to bake a cake in your cupboard, regardless of whether you have the box. And that is what Job brings to the table. That's what books like Ecclesiastes bring to the table, are the exceptions to the simple rules on the side of the box. And here's why this is important. Because life is full of exceptions. And if you want to become a good baker, you have to move on from simple cake mix. You have to learn other ways of making cakes. And if you want to be moving from being simply a good baker to a great baker, then you need to learn how to adapt and change and explore and create new kinds of cakes. And that is what this wisdom section creates for us, is a world of simple rules, and if you follow them, you'll do well, but also these deeply important exceptions that are also a part of baking cakes and doing that well. The central question of the book of Job is this. Do people only serve God? Do they only do what God asks because of what they get out of it? 
In essence, it's asking if there's any genuine virtue out there. Are there any actually good people? Or is everyone just engaged in some kind of transactional relationship with God? Follow the recipe on the box, receive delicious cake. What the characters in Job don't know is that this cake box question is being put to the test. What the audience, what we are privy to in those first few chapters is that the accuser has called this whole recipe into question. They put this to the test. And what we know is that Job is a good man and Job is suffering. That somehow there is a disconnect. Job does the right things, but bad things are resulting. And this isn't just Job saying, I'm a good person. This is, these are the words of God. And in the end, you're going to see this next week, and I don't want to take away anything from Jessica's section, but God agrees with Job. And what I have found fascinating this week in reading all of the commentaries, especially from the evangelical side of the fence, is people still want to blame Job for Job's sufferings. I find it totally fascinating. Now, today we have a special focus. We're looking at chapters 29 and 37. And, uh, and in, in these chapters, we have two separate speeches. The first speech is Job's final plea. So these are not Job's final words, but this is, these are Job's final pleas. Questioning this Betty Crocker mix that he finds himself in. And then that speech is immediately followed by the speech of a young man named Elihu. And Elihu has been silent up until this point, okay? And he's been listening to the senior bakers kind of duke it out. And now, in the end, this young man finally breaks his silence. And his speech runs from chapters 32 to 37, and it's a real whopper, okay? So stay tuned. But there's something we need to notice before we get into Job's final speech here. Now, what we know from the beginning of the story is that Job's suffering is he has lost everyone and everything, and now he's even lost his health. I mean, literally everything. He was a rich man that lost everything. But as you notice, as we dig into uh, Job's speech, when he talks about his former life, he doesn't mention any of the stuff that he lost. He's actually mentioning something brand new. He's not talking about his suffering in specific, in terms of his body or his fortunes or the loss of his family. He's actually talking about something brand new that's developing in his life, and it's this. His community has started to turn on him. And it's turned on him to the degree where even the outcasts are starting to treat him as an outcast. He has now become the lowest of the low in his community. And honestly, people are getting vicious and things are getting dangerous for Job. You see, Job has lived in two worlds. The first world sounds like this. My f steps were awash in cream and the rocks gushed olive oil for me. Those were the days when I went to the city gate and I took my place among the honored leaders. The young stepped aside when they saw me and, and, and the aged rose in respect of my coming. The princes stood in silence and put their hands over their mouths. The highest officials of the city stood quietly holding their tongues in respect. 
And after I spoke, they had nothing to add. And my counsel satisfied them. They longed for me to speak as people long for rain. They drank my words like refreshing spring rain. When they were discouraged, I smiled at them. My look of approval was precious to them. Like a chief, I told them what to do. I lived like a king among his troops and comforted those who mourned. This is how Job remembers his past. But this is how Job experiences the present. And now they mock me with vulgar songs. They taunt me. They despise me and won't come near me except to spit in my face. For God has cut my bowstring. He has humbled me so that they have thrown off all restraint. These outcasts, so remember, these aren't just the center powerful people. These are the people that get kicked out of all the other meetings too. The outcasts oppose me to my face. They send me sprawling and lay traps in my path. They block my road and do everything they can to destroy me. They know that I have no one to help me. They come at me from all directions. They jump on me when I am down. I live in terror now. My honor was blown away in the wind, and my prosperity has vanished like a cloud. So how does a community leader move from being celebrated and loved to being hated by everyone? Even the outcasts are kicking him out. How does that happen? When someone experiences a house fire, we don't gather around and make fun of them. We have pity on them. Why isn't Job at least being pitied by people? Well, this is a process that a man named Rene Girard calls the scapegoat mechanism. And this process is unfortunately not uncommon. In fact, it is embedded into all human communities. And it basically works like this. People experience desire in community. We mirror each other in our desires. And if I see you wanting something, it makes me want that thing. And if I have a thing and you see me wanting this thing, desiring this thing, it makes that thing more valuable. Now, this is something that, that is literally a pillar of our economic system. The laws of supply and demand. It's the demand side of that equation. Our neighbors in this process of rivalry become our enemy because this thing that they want has value. And this envy begins to fuel our imaginations and our actions. And envy causes us all of a sudden to spend less energy on getting the thing. And instead, we turn our energy on our rivals. The problem is no longer we don't have the thing. The problem becomes the them. The, those people, that group that has all of the things, they are so selfish, they are so evil, they throw off, they are wanton in the way that they live, they're crazy. And they're thing takers. That's one of the worst things about them. And once they become the problem, then all of the reasons we don't have the thing, all of the, the problems that we have as a community can easily be explained by their existence. They are the problem. They are the reason bad stuff is happening in our community. And every win for them is a loss for us. And every loss for them is a win for us. You know what would be really great? If they weren't around anymore. Why can't they just go back to where they came from? 
You know how great life would be if they weren't here? You know, here's the reality. If we don't look after ourselves, they will get rid of us. So what we need to do is we need to get rid of them first. And you can feel the energy in the crowd begin to grow. And you can hear the pounding of the pulpit. You can hear the finger jabbing in the air. How's it going, buddy? <laughs> and you can hear it end with, who's with me? You can see this process at work in our wars. You can see this process at work in our politics. You can even see it in the nursery in our church. By the way, Paul's over there serving the nursery. He's been running back and forth in the, in the, in the church all morning. We have no adult supervisions right now. Here. It's all over there. But here's a funny thing that happens over there. There's probably in, in one of our little toy boxes a toy that nobody plays with anymore. Nobody even knows it exists. But then little Johnny goes over to that toy box and he pulls this thing out that no one has ever valued. And then as soon as little Johnny pulls that truck up out of the toy box, that toy truck becomes the most incredible toy that has ever been conceived of by a human being. And that, that little moment is where little human beings go from happy little play friends to pinchy, bitey, punchy people. <laughs> this is the scapegoat mechanism. It's how we rally the troops, and it's often how we form our communities and our identities. Because sometimes it's not as easy to form around the things we are and have. Sometimes it's easier to form our identities around who we're not and what we don't have. So what's going on here in Job? Well, Job's friends are delegates of the mob. They are delegates of an us. And Job has recently become a them. And the mob lives by the Betty Crocker recipe. Good people do good things, and those good things lead to blessing, and bad people do bad things, and those bad things lead to their destruction. Job is suffering, and therefore he's bad. The writing on the box says so. And unfortunately, they are beginning to make the accuser's case for him. They are trapped in a purely transactional relationship with virtue and with God. The process Job, and in the process, Job has become their scapegoat and their recipe has become a replacement for God. As the saying goes, vox populi, vox dei, which means the voice of the people is the voice of God. And here is the interesting thing about the book of Job. The book of Job, therefore, is a fantastic battleground between the two great conceptions of the divine, the mob conception, which is that God is, is an elaboration of society and that God is totally alien to that, so far from human ways and so hostile to all of our victimizations, we don't understand him at all. We're gonna see that played out next week when Jessica speaks. But for, for today, the stakes for Job can't be higher. Here's why. The crowd needs this recipe to work. They need him not only to be destroyed, they need him to suffer, yes, but they also need him to agree with them. Or else the recipe starts getting called into question. They need him to admit his guilt. The recipe demands that scapegoats are always guilty. 
And to be honest, there are lots of times when the recipe is correct. There's a reason we use Betty Crocker cake mix. It's because it makes delicious cakes. It works until it doesn't. And here is the thing about Job. He is actually a good man. And he genuinely cannot find the guilt the crowd so desperately wants him to admit to. It just isn't there, and Job is so honest, he won't manufacture it for them. Because that would be a lie. And honest men don't lie. So the virtue of Job becomes this breakdown in the recipe, this bug in the system, this crack in the wall. And Job's virtue threatens to dismantle the whole social order. And because of this, Job becomes public enemy number one. The worst of the worst, the scum of the earth, the outcasts of the outcast. And people are right to heap abuse on Job. In fact, the more abuse you heap on Job, the more righteous you become. That's the way this recipe works. The more you can punch him down, the more you can mock him, the more righteous you become, according to this recipe. I mean, this is so fascinating to watch getting played out. Job is innocent, and there's nothing he can do about his innocence. He is. And they desperately need his confession so that the society holds together. And here is the funny thing that that Christians often say to atheists. They are under the impression that if you are an atheist, you can't be a good person. Because there are no rules, you can do whatever you want. I want to warn you, Christians, and I want to warn you, religious people, If you replace your recipe with God, God then gives you permission to do whatever you want as well. We are all in the same boat here together. We are all threatened together. And if we don't actually understand what actual goodness is, actual virtue is, we're all in a lot of trouble. God can give you permission if it's the God on the side of a Betty Crocker box, to do all kinds of evil. And that is where our poor friend Job finds himself. So, driven by the mob, Job desperately searches his own character, his actions, and his life, and Job outlines the basic recipe for a good life and runs a mental checklist. And you can, you can read that in some, some of the verses in these chapters. We don't have time to get into it at all, but here's some of how this might sound. Though I had privilege over others, did I hold those privileges wisely and kindly? And Job says, yes, yes, I did that. Did I give away my power and privilege to others? Check. Did I create space and margin in my finances, in my schedule, in my heart and attention to be a generous to vulnerable people and alleviate suffering where I could? Did I do that? Yes, yes, I did that. Did I cultivate practices and habits of the heart that may be a safe harbor, an ally for vulnerable people, for strangers, for immigrants, for widows, for poor people, for vulnerable young women, for my own workers, my neighbors? Yes, check, done. Was I good to and good for people? Check. Did I practice the art of wisdom? Did I try to give sound counsel to people? Did my counsel actually help? Check, check, check. Did I resist evil in myself and in my society? Yes, yes, I did that. Did I resist being an idol bystander in the face of injustice. Yes, yes, I did that. What about the earth? Did I care for the earth? Did I keep my promises to my own land? Did I not, did I choose not to exploit that land? Right, I did not do that. 
In Job's desperate search of his own character, he essentially outlines the recipe described in Proverbs and Psalms. Now, I want to be clear. Job is not claiming to be perfect. He is simply saying, I exhibited the kinds of virtues that the wisdom books aim to produce in a human being. I followed the recipe and I got cake. But he is also unwilling, unwittingly making a counterclaim to the accuser. Job is saying out loud, virtue does exist. And people can actually desire to do good and not just do good for the sake of getting metaphorical cake. I did these things because I knew they were right. I followed the recipe because I wanted to do the good things. And as Job's words wind to a close, a deep longing for an advocate returns to him. He longs He longs for an intercessor, a a lawyer, an arbitrator, a, a, a helper to help him plead his case. If only someone would listen to me. Look, I will sign my name to my own defense. Let the Almighty answer me. Let my accuser write out the charges against me. I would face the accusation proudly, and I would wear it like a crown. In other words, if I have messed up this recipe, I am willing to own that. Job clearly wants to become a good baker. But the bad cake that's currently sitting in the middle of Job's kitchen still testifies against him. Or maybe it's testifying against the recipe itself. And in this moment, Job falls silent. Job lives in a broken world, a world where the recipe has just failed. For a brief shining moment, they sit in that silence. And then that deep silence is broken by, everyone get ready, an angry young man, (laughs) Elihu. Phew. Enough of the discomfort. Let's get back to what's on the side of the box. Am I right, everybody? Okay. My name's Elihu, and here is how I start. I am a young man. You are old. So I held back from telling you what I think. I thought those who are older should speak, for wisdom comes with age. But there is a spirit within people. The breath of the Almighty within them that makes them intelligent. Sometimes the elders are not wise. Sometimes the aged do not understand justice. So listen to me and let me tell you what I think because my thoughts have feelings too. And this kid really winds up and lets Job have it. Chapter 32, Job. The recipe compels me to speak. Chapter 33. Job, the problem isn't the recipe. The problem is you. Just admitted. Chapter 34. Job, number one. Who do you think you are? Number two. What gives you the right? That's a little office joke for the kids in the back. Chapter 35, Job. Or sorry, I said that already. No, no, I didn't. He goes back to this. He repeats himself. Job, the recipe is right, and it says you're wrong. And then in chapter 36, it begins with this. And Elihu continued speaking. Even the narrator wants this speech to be over. And by the end of the chapter, Elihu is feeling so righteous so godly that he feels like the thunder and lightning of God are flowing through his veins. In chapter 37, Elihu's heart begins to pound with pure and holy rage. The wind, the wind of God fills his lungs and he blows his hot air onto Job. Job, 
Can you feel the wind picking up? Now, I like to imagine this little five-chapter mansplainathon like this. A group of young or a group of men are sitting in the scorching desert heat. And at first, they are listening to this young man and and patiently waiting and and hearing him out. But next, they get distracted by a storm cloud that's on the horizon. And they see that storm start to approach. And uh, sorry, I just realized, okay, I'm going to be like a minute. All right, okay. I am, I am getting, yeah, I just figured out the signal of why they're here, what that means. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sick. It's the storm cloud gathering. He's being surrounded. Elihu is really on a roll, and this storm cloud is gathering behind him, and it's coming, and it's lightning and thunder, and they realize, wait, that's no storm cloud. Wait a second. That's God. And Elihu is, he feels the thunder, and he sees the lightning. He's like, he's feeling like, whoa, this is really going well. And the wind is blowing, and things are getting dark, and he's really, really whipping it up, and the other guys go, <laughs> By the end of Elihu's speech, God is standing behind him while Elihu delivers his last sentences. Now, I don't want to give away what happens next because that's next week. But God doesn't give Elihu a high five and say, well done, buddy. God speaks for God. The mob does not know who God is. It doesn't know the first thing about good cake. So here's what I want to leave you with this week. Neither Job nor his friends are able to notice this broken recipe that they find themselves trapped within. A recipe of rivals turning on one another, a recipe fueled by envy and violence, dripping with the blood of its victims, a recipe that nourishes no one. This is the world we live in, friends. The scapegoat mechanism exists right now in this room. It's large and in charge. And it still gives people groups to blame for their failed cakes. It still fuels our politics. It still runs our economy and is on proud display on Facebook and X just this last week. The good news is that Jesus, another innocent scapegoat, has entered into this system and exposed this system for what it actually is. And so if you are here today and you are part of one of those groups that gets blamed for everything, I want you to know that Jesus of Nazareth has changed the game and you are free. Did you hear me? You are free. You are free from our short, tiny imaginations. You are free from our cake box recipe for your life. You are free. The second is, if you are a little bit of an Elihu, if the keyboard has just stopped clacking on your five-chapter Young man explain-a-thon on Facebook or X. The good news is, God has a plan for you. Now, it is the total destruction of your recipe for living, but, but, you can be set free from that because God has made it possible for all of us to have cake. That belongs to everybody, not just your tiny little us, but for them too. And if you will follow the Jesus plan, God will make a way. So if you're here today, I don't want you leaving this place not knowing the freedom that Jesus has made possible for you. 
If you are here today and you want to talk to somebody about that, find me in the lobby. I want to talk to you. Whether you are a Job or an Elihu, over here in just a moment, there'll be people, thoughtful, generous elders of our community who will pray for you. If you need to hear a message about freedom today, they're here to share it with you. All right, the storm cloud has now gathered, and I am going to get out of here. (laughs) 